time, I'm going to do what needs to be done. Uh, a little to the left. Welcome to Strip Cover Lid, I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we're here with a short story review. Dalton, what are we hitting now? More George Saunders. We're going to get through the 10th of December eventually. If it kills us. This is Victory Lap. Yes. By George Saunders from the 10th of December. Yeah. I just wanted to reiterate. Felt good. Uh, good things, bad things about this short story. I'll start with the good things. Three good things. One, this is a short story that puts us in the heads and the world's of three different characters, which is hard to do in a short story. Correct. Uh, the rapist here has his own world and circumstance, and you don't get that a lot. People stop short of that. Right? Okay. Um, the scene with the aftermath is written very scant, but it is extremely powerful. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of ridiculous, crazy changes in perspective in this, which again, I think it's a lot of characterization. It's hard to do in a short story back and forth. Uh, the, in, the entirety of this story leads to a great moral, philosophical question of what would you do? And I like that. Makes you think. Uh, and again, this is Saunders blending terror and humor. Back and forth, and it's good. I like that. Bad things. Uh... This never really reaches gut punch level, okay. which is what you come to expect from Saunders. Um, the tone here is questionable for what is going on. So questionable, in fact, that at times it becomes cringeworthy. And third, in the Leo Tolstoy meaning of literature sort of sense, uh, this piece is aimed to humanize rapists. Okay. Which is what's happening here. Uh, it is very hard to follow. Although he does get all the characters' perspectives in, and it is very difficult to do, it is hard to follow. Uh, if I had to say, I'm going to sit you down let you read George Saunders, I would not suggest this one. Honestly. Not my favorite. And again, with George Saunders, you get a very abrupt ending that doesn't feel complete, and it leaves me wanting more. Okay. Every time. Uh, quotes. As always, since we have some weird format that we sometimes occasionally follow, uh, I have from page 18... When you studied history, the history of cultures, you saw your own individual time as hidebound. You son of a bitch. Did I pick one of yours finally? That is my entire quote. Well, Mike. Oh, you got the whole thing? Yeah, I went, I went with the whole paragraph. Well, finish it off. Finish it off. When you studied history, the history of cultures, you saw your own individual time as hidebound. There were various theories of acquiescence. In Bible days, a king might ride through a field and go, that one. And she would be brought unto him and they would duly be betrothed, and if she gave birth unto a son, super. But out, bring out the streamers, she was a keeper. Was she that first night digging it? Probably not. Was she shaking like a leaf? Didn't matter. What mattered was offspring and the furtherance of the lineage, plus the exaltation of the king, which resulted in righteous kingly power. That is from the rapist viewpoint, by the way. Yes. Which is what makes it interesting. Uh, I do have one more, more Flanders just uh, flaunting his ridership. That onion dome had loomed in her window since her poo footy days. That is a beautiful sentence. Yeah. That is wonderful. Uh, uh, they're, of course, talking about the Russian church across the street from the yes. woman's perspective in this. Uh, so, what would you like to talk about with Saunders? You know, there's something strange going on with language here. Okay. The uh, alley speaks French. Okay. Uh, Kyle verboten uses verboten. Do you know what that means? What is verboten? It is forbidden in German. Okay. Now, Kyle's the the guy in the piece. Allie's the woman in the piece. The rapist, which as far as I know, did not get a name. Uh, not that I recall. Okay. Did you did you catch his second language? What is his second language? Anything, anything. Just throw something out there. No, I have nothing. Bible. Okay. Betrothed uh, unto uh, The entire quote about the king in the biblical yeah. days. So, okay. So, is that part of this piece? I Absolutely. Think so. Has to be. Because his only ties outside of what's going on here 
are to his stepfather, his friend, and the church. Right. The church is where he finds her. He was out front of the church during some ceremony and saw her in her front yard. Okay. Um, he speaks about kings and in Bible days, right? Okay. So there's this question of power coming from his perspective. And would you go to, as far to say as maybe if we're looking back towards Carrie, uh, with Carrie White's mother, is there a justification, uh, a crazed religious justification in ends to his means? I don't know. Yeah? Uh, I never picked up on that much. I picked up on the fact that this, um, when you look at the characters involved here, when you look at Allie and Kyle and the rapist, Allie is very self-centered. Okay. Uh, the entire time that we're spent with Allie at the beginning, she is uh, dreaming about herself and the man that she might find, mm -hmm. dot, dot, dot. Kyle seems very hardworking, right? He ran home from school after track practice to do chores. Very hardworking, very plain. Right. Very, it, it is what it is. And the good uh, old farm boy. Right. And the rapist is looking for authority, is looking to have something. Okay. Is looking, is looking for ownership. So you have it like almost a goal, if you would, for every character, and it, it is pulled in different directions. Uh, very much so with Kyle, uh, because his goal is to just be there and exist. But he is, his hand is forced, essentially. Right. Uh, which... Which is very human. It's very human. Right. And that leads to the huge moral philosophy with this entire thing of... How do you react in that situation? I think that's, that is the interesting, makes you think what you take away from this piece. It makes you think, what would I do? Right. Uh, because I think of any situation you've been faced with where there's some possible threat to someone else's life or your life, how did you react to that? Uh, and I think we have both react very differently to situations like that. Uh, so, yeah. Well, if you want to go back to Carrie, who was the the nice person in Carrie? Are Sue, you, Sue eventually, Tommy. yes. Tommy, for sure. Right. And what was what was their grand gesture? Taking Just, Carrie to the prom. Because Sue couldn't go anyway. Yeah. Right. So I think that when you're looking at levels of, of reaction, this kid fucking murks somebody, right? Yeah. And then celebrates while it's going on. Yeah. Right? So but I think I, that's... Look at that situation, though. If you are Kyle in this situation, you just drop the figurative rock. You're the fucking white knight. Yeah. Do you feel bad about that? Do you feel remorse? I think this goes to a question of, it's a human, this is a human interest question, right? Is there any justification to kill? And to kill in cold blood? And see, I think it's wonderful that Saunders uses the rock. Uh, because the rock is a physical tool that requires contact. You have to consciously make that decision to lift the heavy rock, drop the heavy rock with a, a fervor, and doesn't he hit him twice with it just to be safe? Uh, I, I don't remember that. I think I he clocks he hits, him once. He hits him with the geode. First. Okay, yes. Pop, throws that. Pops throws him that once sword. and then takes him out. Right. It's not just the, uh, the pulling of the trigger, which is very... Inhuman, inhuman. Very cold and removed. Very cold, very removed. This is not execution by, by lethal injection. Absolutely not. This is doing what's got to be done. But right. is it okay in Kyle's situation? I um, think yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I believe, I, yeah, if you're in that situation, you, you kill the son of a bitch. Um, but the, the thing that's interesting to me in that scene is, again, you brought up the rock. Okay. When you think about evolution, for example... Rocks were our first tools. Okay. Rocks, what, what else is a rock? A rock is early stone. Okay. Or, or stone for building. So it's, right? it's very human by essence. That's the thing that's interesting, is that you pick this very primitive primal weapon. Okay. Which is also used as the foundation of civilization. Okay. And you're using it to take somebody out. Okay. And that's why you're putting it in the situation where it is, uh, look, you go back to the, like he says, Bible days. R rape happened. Yes. It wasn't rape. It was just, it was a fact of life. They didn't have the word rape, really. You know what And I mean? the fact that the rapist was stoned. Right. Essentially. Right. Uh, it's a wonderful touch. And is it, 
Yeah, that's absolutely, it was placed there for a reason. Yeah. Uh, the whole concept of the geode is a little ridiculous to start with, but it was there for a reason because he stoned the, the rapist. Right. That's what happened. And went from throwing stones, casting stones, to straight up smashing somebody's head. Yeah. Right. Uh, I know you haven't read The Hunger Games, right. uh, and you probably never will. No. This is how The Hunger Games should have ended. <laughs> uh, I know every person watching this has read The Hunger Games. When old PETA picks up that rock, that's what should have happened. Uh, and it would have been a good novel. Right. So, um, another thing I, I, I want to point out here. These kids, what world do they live in? What do you mean, what world? I assume ours, modern world. Modern world? Yes. Who are these kids? Uh, these are the kids on your block when you're in high school. Mm, you don't, I don't think know so? What block you grew up on. These very much seem like upper middle class kids. Okay, that's what you get. At an economic status, yes. Right. I look at the concept of the geode. We've got the geode. Don't be very careful. Don't break it. It's worth a ridiculous amount of money. Right. This nice fancy rock. What about the rapist? Where's he from? Well, I would assume since he's driving a stolen van. It is a stolen van, isn't it? Semi-stolen. Semi-stolen. from a friend, but not for this. Uh, he doesn't have a car. He doesn't have a car. He borrowed this. We get, he's on the lower end of the economic scale. Lived with his parents until at a very pronounced age, it seems. Mm -hmm. Right? So is there, a, is there something being said there? And that's a difficult question to ask. Uh, is there something to be said there, or is Saunders just falling into stereotype? Now, I would imagine from having read Saunders prior, no. Mm, what about that uh, old southern boy in Escape from Spiderhead? And that's one you're going to bring up. And I mean, but look at Simplica Girl Diaries. Look at the constant comment on wealth. Right. Which is not to excuse someone from falling into the same tropes. Okay. I, I'm going to say Saunders knew what he was doing. Well, you, well yeah. 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 But... Well, you gotta have a poor guy for the rapist, don't you? <laughs> well, right. I mean, like that—that's that, uh, the commentary. Is that the commentary being made? He, maybe, maybe. Uh, is the argument? Is he from a lower economic status? I would agree, yes. Uh, would is he from a lower education status? I would agree, yes. Um, I don't think that is a forced comment he's pushing, though. He's the that character is the only one who mentions religion. So now are we going to lack of income, lack of education means heightened religion sense, religious sense? You got that authority from somewhere, don't you? So do we read this as a pro-atheist piece? I don't know that you can go that far. I think you might be looking at sort of an anti... Well, you just said it. Right. You ain't got money, you ain't got school, but you got Jesus, and he's going to save you. And he is going to be the one who allows this to happen. Right. It's going to be okay because... So what I'm saying is this... Is this Pro-atheist or anti-poor people? Uh, <laughs> well, this got deep really fast. Um, I, would, I would lean almost more towards anti-religion if we're going to go that full route argument. Uh, because in this piece, it, it seems the religious man is the bad guy. Uh, it seems to be all the pieces we've read recently. Look at Carrie. Uh, religion is a bad thing. It poisons the mind. Look at uh, Animal Farm. Look at Animal Farm. Moses. Uh, so I, I'm assuming that you're just doing this on purpose now. I'm planting these things. And you're leading this to a grand Christopher Hitchens special. <laughs> uh, the Christopher Hitchens holiday special. Christmas special, yes. Uh, anyway. Christmas for Hitchens. Lead me somewhere else so my brain is not falling to pieces. So we've got this, we've got the world of the rapist in here, don't we? Yes. We get little bits of his history, don't we? Yes, we get little bits of history from all the characters. Right, but, but I mean, you expect that from, from the protagonist. Kyle and yes. Alan. Not often do we venture into this world of the antagonist that was a rapist. Did you catch something? What, what did you notice about that rapist's history? Tell me what I'm supposed to say. I'm, I'm not going to answer your questions this week. So Melvin. Okay. Remember Melvin, the stepfather figure. Okay. Did you, did you notice anything with that relationship? Absolutely not. No? No. Okay, so... The rapist in this piece has a guilty conscience anyway. Okay. He's talking, he, he curses at himself in his own thoughts. You fucked up again, didn't you? You fucked it up, didn't you? Cursing at himself, right? This is the type of nomenclature that an abused person uses with himself. Okay. Uh, also, one step further, and I did not mark it, I should have. We get this quote from him 
at some point where he's cursing at himself and then he slips into Melvin's voice. He slips into the stepfather's voice and he says, you fucked up again, didn't you? You got had by a kid. And shortly after that, we're back in the rapist's head and he says, that's when Melvin would beat you. And then there was the other thing. Okay. So this guy was raped as a child. Yeah. Would you I, imagine I think that's, that's what the other thing is? That's got to be. That's uh, saying it without saying it. Yeah. Um, because if you're going to go the trope of abuse, that, that would be what your mind would go towards. Uh, I think I genuinely need to sit and read through this one again. There is so much going on with not only having three different characters, having three different storylines that somehow arc together, but every character has characters talking to them who aren't part of the actual story. One character has characters talking to him and through him. And this was so muddled and beyond me. So I completely just glazed over Melvin. Yeah, I think one of the things that you have to be prepared for when you get into a Saunders piece is multiple viewpoints. Yes. Because I, I, this was, I read this collection in full, cover to cover, after having read about five or six other pieces from Saunders. Okay. So I am not able to really judge whether or not that transition was jarring. This is my second read through this. Uh, so I, I was right there you with it. You were ready it. for it. I was right there with it. From my first reading of this piece and my fourth Saunders piece in relatively recent history, this was very jarring and very difficult to follow. And, but remember, in Escape from Spiderhead, you didn't know what was going on at first. Correct. And in Simplica Girl Diaries, you didn't know, know what, what was the going. Simplica Girls were. But it felt like midway through, halfway through, at some point it clicked. I'm like, okay, now I'm, I feel comfortable, I'm good. See, this is... At no point did this feel comfortable for me. Really? And I think that's important. You didn't notice... Did you not notice the white space between characters? There's white space between characters, but to distinguish who's talking, especially from the very beginning, when you don't know the characters and you don't know what you're getting into, you're given... Kyle boot dashed through a garage into the living area, and then you're in Kyle's head. I don't know, I was just very muddled through this. Uh, so I think a second, a second read through wouldn't be terrible. Uh, however, I don't know. I, I really don't feel like this one really clicked with me, that I liked it. Uh, I do think maybe the jarring elements of just going back and forth between characters pulls together that sense of alarm, pulls together that sense of rush, because this is not a long time span. The no. moment that this would take to happen is, boom, split decision. You may have pages where you're reading about Kyle trying to make the decision of what he should do, but no, you don't have that. It's do or die, fight or flight. Right. So maybe that is part of it. Maybe it is a little bit muddled like that, so it does feel rushed back and forth. Uh, it just didn't quite work for me. It's interesting for me to hear this coming from a sci-fi reader. Okay. Sci-fi worlds are very thrust upon you. Yes. Fantasy worlds are very thrust upon you. So you, I would imagine, are the type of reader who would be able to come into this with that jarring, that ability to recognize jarring behaviors. I don't think so. Uh, in a sci-fi novel, when you pick it up, you are sitting down knowing what you're getting into. You're knowing that it's going to be a complete alternate reality most times. Um, we're talking sci-fi fantasy here. Uh, but it is grounded. There is always backstory to the world. There is always a history to the world. Most have a map of the world right here. So you know where you're going. You know what you're getting into. Right. This is your fourth George Saunders, and you've been lost in each one of them. Don't you know what you're getting into? I'm not prodding here. And, and maybe, maybe that's it. Uh, lost at some points, yes. Uh, I was lost in Simplica Girls. I enjoyed it at the end. 10th of December. You, 10th of December, you very lost, and I, I didn't enjoy it. Uh, Escape from Spiderhead, lost in the beginning. Loved it. One of my favorite short stories now. Uh, Saunders is a very confusing writing style for me, and I don't know why. Um, I think maybe next time we run into Saunders, maybe I'll sit down and try to figure out what I'm reading and what's really going wrong for me. I think there's great writing here. There is. 
Victory Lap, not so much in my opinion. Uh, but with like the Escape from Spiderhead, there's beautiful writing there. Beautiful. And you still get those Saunders elements. You still get the humor mixed in with all of this. Yes. Uh, I don't know. There's some kind of layout structure, something that isn't working for me. Yeah, he, well, he, he doesn't announce anything. He just does it. Okay. And there's very similitude in that, I believe. Okay. Right, this is that world, and it is unapologetically so. And I will say to his credit, what he does, he does well, and that is what he does. Absolutely. Uh, he's not going to beg out or cop out and say, all right, I'll do it different because this isn't working for you, Dalton. No, I'm George fucking Saunders. This way I'm going to write it. Yeah. Uh, so good for him. And I will say that most of his work is that way. Well, not just in this collection, but a lot of his work puts you in a world unapologetically so and expects you to swim. Okay. Uh, no, I'm the kid who gets thrown in the pool and almost drowns. I uh, can't swim. Well, see, there you go. There you go. You understand my feeling right now. Yes. Uh, Adrian, what would you rate this? I would give this 90 geos out of 100 because for me, it is impossible to let Saunders slip below the A range. Okay. Right? What about yourself? Uh, I'm going to go 82. 82? Uh, this did not work for me. But you could... Okay, so you've got those three good things and you've got your three bad things. What stood out most to you in here? Confusion? Yes. Uh, going back and forth and trying to distinguish who's speaking, who isn't speaking, uh, what character's doing what, what character's doing this. Because all the, char the characters are witnessing the other characters. Yeah. So you're getting the multiple perspectives. And maybe it's just overload on perspective. I don't know. Uh, but there's something there that's just not working for me. Okay. I would say, if you enjoyed this... No, not George Saunders. I'm not going to plug it this time. I'm going to give you this one. Uh, if you enjoy having the perspective of the mind of a psychopath, Darkly Dreaming Dexter by Jeffrey Lindsay, which is the Showtime series Dexter is based off of. Poplet, yeah. Uh, but Lindsay writes from the perspective of a noted sociopath. Uh, so you do get a lot of that uh, mental play. He does speak with his father because his whole killing ideal is based on what his father taught him. So his father is a character in his head. Very similar to the rapist in this. Okay. Uh, I would go with Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? by Joyce Carol Oates. And I'm terrified because you just texted me that today and said, you should read this. Well, what happens is um, a guy shows up at a girl's door who's home alone. And his name is Arnold Friend. Okay. And he's he's going. He, he takes the girl. He's going to rape her, right? He's going. To, he's going to ruin her. And um, it's just it's so dark, but set up in such a an almost light fashion. And she does in that piece very much what Shirley Jackson does in the haunt, House on Haunted Hill, The Haunting. Uh, she will. She shows you Arnold Friend. And the closer our old friend gets, the more things you notice about him. Okay. Until you realize this guy is basically a 40-year-old man dressed as an 18-year-old and, and going around doing this to different women. So Adrian suggests this to me because a uh, deranged man came to my doorstep today, uh, went to the front door, which no one goes to, uh, and I go to answer it, and I peek through my little window blind and see, oh, crack. Uh, this man does drugs. So I'm like, can I help you? And he wants to buy my car. And I keep you know, informing him, you're not going to, no, no, please go away. And he keeps on insisting about coming in and discussing my car, which is parked behind the house. Uh, and when I won't let him in, he gets really pissy and leaves. And then Adrian tells me to read this. So thank you. Here's I'm very comforted now. A 17-year-old girl who has been left home alone. That is me, actually. <laughs> if there's a bump, I'm the one who's like, nope, I'll die. Spider? There's a spider? I don't do spiders. Anyway, so if you like this, if you like some 10th of December, we're going to get through a lot more of it. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button on this video so we pop up and get some more 10th of December out for more people. And uh, give us a follow through social media, Adrian. On Twitter, at Strip Cover. On Facebook, at Strip Cover Lit. And on Instagram, at Strip Cover Lit. That's right. An in and a name. Anagram. An anagram. Banana name.